Luke, Luke chapter number 19, please. Luke chapter number 19. Uh, we started Luke 19 last week with the first 10 verses. Uh, the first 10 verses addressed the, uh, the story of Zacchaeus. Of course, his salvation uh, is, is sp spoken about, and of course, the, the changed life because he is a saved man. And so that, that's, a, uh, that's a blessing to see that. We've seen just uh, event after event after event where Jesus Christ saves people, and as he has saved them, things change, things changed. And so it's, it's wonderful when people believe on him, what he does. And so there's a work that they do, which is just obedience to faith. They, they believe on him. And then there's a work that Jesus does, which is everything else. He's the one that does it all. And so, uh, so that's, that's a wonderful thing. And of course, verse number 10 is, is a culmination of several chapters worth of Jesus doing a great number of things. And that's, uh, that's this, for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. So, that, that verse is a, is a powerful verse that he has come to seek and to save. Jesus Christ came not, not to do a lot of good miracles. And, and I'd be excited to see miracles, but that's not why Jesus Christ came. Jesus Christ did not come only to, to establish a kingdom. That's part of the plan. But it's not, not the reason why he arrived then. But it's to come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, this brings up a lot of questions. For instance, if you look up in verse number 9, it says, And Jesus said unto him, uh, talking to Zacchaeus, this day is salvation come to this house for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. And he talks about the fact that he's doing something. Now, in this, this is similar to what he would address with Paul later on in the book of Romans, when he talks about the fact that the, 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 the tree, if you will, that's cut off, that he can be grafted back in. The idea here is that this is of that house grafted back in. And so when we have that understanding, he's saying, look, they, you come to seek and to save that which was lost. They need salvation and lost. And this is what he has. It's what a blessing he has, not to, not to mention the fact that he speaks of Abraham specifically addressing the spiritual aspect of the salvation, not simply one that's purely genetic, and so, or, or, or genetic at all. Salvation is spiritual. And so in this, um, he's addressing this as a, as a powerful thing, that this is why he's come, to, to grant salvation. That, that's why he came. This is a very powerful thought because he did a lot, but he wasn't here a very long time. Now, when he was walking upon the earth, Jesus had a ministry of about three years. There's a lot of questions whether or not it was three and a half years or three years. Usually the three and a half year idea has to do with an April, um, April crucifixion and a December birth. And so the timeline um, is, is wrapped around the three, little, maybe three and a quarter years. So there's a lot of questions in regards to how that works. But the point is three years at least. And, um, and anyways, by this point, we're going to see a transition that's going to take place um, starting really at verse number 11 where it's going to lead us into what's going to be happening next. Now, Jesus has been journeying. He's been traveling throughout the past few chapters to a certain city. Does anybody remember where the destination was? To Jerusalem. That's the plan. That's where he's going. And people are mad at him. They don't like it. Um, some people are excited. And so there's a bunch of people that are gathering around him, and they're excited to be part of this big old group. And so while they're gathering together, and while they're following him, it's enough where he was outside of Jericho, and the blind man calls out to him. And uh, willing to go through the shame, being shushed by the crowd, he gets louder. Jesus saves this guy. Uh, we see Zacchaeus as he's coming through Jerusalem. Now he's right there outside of Jerusalem, and Zacchaeus climbs up on a sycamore. I'm sorry, Jer Jericho climbs up on a sycamore tree, and, uh, and and to see Jesus. And Jesus goes and stays at his house that day. Um, salvation to that house is what he describes. Now they're passing through, and they're heading to to Jerusalem. So Jericho is basically the last stop. They, they have a little ways to go. There's one last hill, basically, and a small journey all the way to Jerusalem. They're heading there. Here's a plan. Now, starting in verse 28, we're going to see where he actually gets all the preparations for that entry. But this is right there. They're about to go in. Now, if you catch what's going on, Jesus is speaking about salvation. He's speaking about salvation, and they're not getting it. They think, son of Abraham, aha, kingdom time. That's what he's talking about. He's saying, no, there, there's something you're missing here. The salvation is not so you as a kingdom can get everything that you, your hearts wished for and hoped for. So that he's going to be doing something with the kingdom later. But right now, here's something that's very important. He's establishing this kingdom in, in your hearts, salvation. He's talking about salvation from sin. The Bible describes that in the book of Matthew, chapter number one, that, that he would save his people from their sin. This is the plan. And so this is what he's doing. 
preaching. He's been preaching and people are gathered around and excited. And ultimately, they're going into Jerusalem. Here comes King Jesus. He's coming in and their goal is to be able to march on in with him with this mighty Jesus. And, and so the questions start coming up. And uh, when he talks about this that takes place, the reference um, that, are, that is given in verse number 9 and 10, people heard it. And verse 11 says, And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable. Why? It tells you why. Because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. So he has told them, by the way, he told them not too long ago, it's not going to be, we saw this uh, back a couple chapters ago, that it's not going to be with, with, with a buildup. It's not going to be something that um, that's gonna, you're going to see it uh, forming. And so talking about the immediate nature of it, they're showing up and they've applied some of it apparently by this point because they're like, aha, here comes an immediate arrival of the kingdom. You're going to walk in and boom, you're going to take over the whole world. That sounds good, except they're slightly misunderstanding what he's talking about. You ever have somebody, they try telling them something, they just don't get it? over and over and over and over again. That's them. I've told, told people, like, go do something, and they're like, okay, so how do we do it? Uh, just do it. Like, I, 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 I make fun of you guys. Like, hey, don't bring food. And we don't know how to, like we talked about this morning, fellowship means food, right? But it doesn't, it doesn't, but we, we try to separate those two things, and like, no, no, it means food, right? Okay, so no food means, means less food. No, it means no food. Uh, we're going to do something, and we can have food if you want to, but it doesn't mean the same exact thing. And, uh, and I, I get the same thing. If somebody invites me over to fellowship, I'm assuming food. That's how it works. And uh, people will ask us over to their house and say, what can we bring? Oh, nothing. Okay, that means we'll just bring something else. <laughs> or we'll bring, we'll, bring, uh, we'll bring a cake or something or a gift. And, and so we don't process it. Likewise, they're, they're not processing what Jesus is telling them. And so, um, so in this, we know that Jesus has been doing a lot. He's been healing diseases. He's been saving people. He's been bringing people back to life. That's a, that's, a, that's a pretty big deal. These things, of course, are prophesied about it, and so no doubt the people have this in mind that here comes the kingdom. Perhaps it would be the time which he would overthrow Rome. In fact, even after Jesus dies and is resurrected and his days upon this earth ministering, they're still asking the question, now is it time? They don't really drop this question. And so uh, is it time for the kingdom to immediately appear or suddenly appear is the idea. And as they're crossing back, he's explaining something to them. Look at the parable. He's going to teach them a parable. Now, I want to remind you about something. The parables are in relation to the kingdom. He's teaching the kingdom. So he is going to teach to them about the kingdom, and he uses parables. Now, why is this important? Because um, sometimes we look at parables and, like, what, what kind of life lesson is he teaching? Well, they're not for life lessons, generally, except as pertaining to the kingdom. And so, for instance, we're going to be part of the kingdom, hence being citizens of that kingdom there's a certain way we have to live and and uh and anyway so there there's life lessons in that regards but he's teaching something about the nature of the kingdom using parables and luke has already established this earlier on that's how that's why he's using parables to teach this all right the, the reason i mention that is because people can take these parables and run a lot of different ways with them and and they do They're very very frequently people get all sorts of doctrines from the parable that are simply not there because uh, he's teaching something very specific you notice the context. People are wondering about the kingdom. There's the murmuring. So he says, I can teach a parable about this kingdom. So what's the, king, the parable about? The kingdom. All right. So with that in mind, let's look what the parable says. Verse, 15, uh, verse 12, excuse me. He said, I had two cups of coffee, by the way. Can you all tell? I feel, okay, good. All right. I'm going 50%. I'm trying to intentionally go slow. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. What does that mean? So the nobleman is one that's going to be able to lay claim to something. And by doing so, he's establishing his authority. So he goes there, establishes his authority, and then he's going to come back to that to, to rule that, that, that kingdom. And so what this means is, is unusual because for us, somebody gets elected president, for instance. A few months later, they're, they're the president. Um, but we understand something. Until they are, until that inauguration, until that oath is taken, they are not actually the president, right? And so, for instance, uh, I'm sure there's a day that that you remember of, because uh, in, in, it's mentioned constantly. That's of course what date? January, January 6th. You hear it? 
all the time, all the time. You don't have to know anything about it. You're going to hear it constantly. It's like the, the biggest day in the world. There's, there's Pearl Harbor, Twin Towers, January 6th. And so with all those things that are going on in our history um, and in past, we bring up those things because on that day, it was important that there was going to be this voting that would be taking place within our, our bodies of, of, of leadership within this country that would verify the election for somebody that would become president and still at that point was not president. And so uh, for them, though, the nobleman lays claim, lays a stake, and so he is king, but he's not applied his kingdom. He's not applied his, his kingliness in regards to that authority. Well, no doubt he has the authority, but he's not actively reigning at that point. This is what he's talking about. He, he gets it to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So there's those two things, right? So it's his, but he's going to come back for it. So verse number 13. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. The message tonight is occupy till I come. The, the command that Jesus is, is, is reiterating here, the, some, the point that he's making is the necessity that these ten servants had to occupy. Now, I think the word occupy, and we normally think within the realm of military, right? And I, for instance, I, I enjoy history of, of military, and, and I've studied a lot of battles and, and um, from different different. Um, different areas of, of history, and I, I've loved in, in the past, I've made a big emphasis about like Roman warfare and the Peloponnesian Wars and studied that in ancient warfare. And later on, I was fascinated with the Civil War because my pastor really was a big Civil War buff. And, and so I studied that out, and then I studied, I, 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 um, I studied with the focus on, uh, on um, history since 1900, and so I studied a lot about like World War I and World War II and some of the other wars that were going on, and studying some of those things, I've, I've spent a lot of time in Bible warfare and seeing some of the strategies and landscape, and looking at all those things, there's a lot of interesting things that take place and how important it is to occupy something, and the idea is they, they have control of it. But I want you to take the word occupy when it comes to military and remove that out of your mind. There is an aspect of it that, that would be there, but we, we sing that about occupy till I come as far as like hold the fort uh, for I am coming. That, that sounds good, but the concept of occupy is literally be occupied. All right, now that's an oversimplification of the term, but the idea is that you are doing your job. You're like, uh, like for instance, we would use the word occupation, for instance. That would be the similar idea. You're, you're busy about doing what you're supposed to. In other words, Occupy. Go ahead and, and you got a job to do. Go ahead and do it until I come. And so you fill what you're supposed to do in its fullness until I come. In other words, you're a manager of something. And you've got this job until I do it. Uh, I, I worked for a gym for a while. I ran a gym in, uh, in Alabama where uh, we were trying to phase out of the franchise that we were a part of and uh, going under private ownership. And so I was going to manage the gym, uh, continue, and he wanted me to manage the gym. And so I talked to the guy. His name was Ron. And he said, um, so I, I said, okay, what kind of stuff do you want me to do? What kind of reports do you want me to turn in? And, and how are we going to do this? We want to do, we want to have a great gym. And he said, if I have to manage you, I don't need you. <laughs> I just, I need you to, to do it. And I'll come check on you periodically. But, um, but I just need you to take some ownership and just do it. Just do it. So I said, okay. And I just had that thought. I was like, if I don't, if I don't. If I need to manage you, I don't need it. Like I'm the, but he said, you're the manager. I'm hiring you to manage, not so I can manage you, uh, so I can manage. And so, oh, okay, that's a very simple principle. This is kind of what's going on here. Jesus is talking about this nobleman, that he comes and he takes this. This now belongs to him. He, he, he acquires, if you could, the deed, the ownership of this, that, that the, this is, will be his reign, and he's going to come back. In the meantime, got to get some stuff settled, so occupy. The idea of occupy is there's a lot of work to do. There's, there's work that needs to be established so that the whole kingdom is ready. Now, this does not mean what a lot of people have taken it to mean. Unfortunately, a lot of people have taken this type of passage and said um, a, a type of dominion type Christianity where we're going to occupy an area. We claim these streets for Jesus. We claim, and what, what it is is that the church then as it spreads throughout the world will claim certain portions for Jesus so that when Jesus returns, here's our portion that's ready. And we would literally usher in the kingdom of Jesus by occupying the kingdom in preparation for it. Now, the reason why this is important, it's not consistent with anywhere else in Scripture. And they would take a passage like this, say, aha, here's the proof. But this is a parable. All right, this is a parable. Uh, now, in this, he, he's not teaching this dominion type of thing. And now, oftentimes, it's associated more so with like, uh, like charismatics of different varieties. Uh, charismatics are not just Pentecostals. But there's a bunch of groups um, that they would apply this type of ownership or dominion over an area. Um, if that's the case, if that's what the plan was, it's not working very well. 
right? Uh, so so anyway, that wasn't the plan. It's not what he's doing. And we'll notice that uh, with the prevalence of churches, the churches are growing. We have the largest churches of all times right now in history. Do you realize back in 2000, I think, I want to say it's 2000, maybe it's 2002, that there was a church down in South Korea that reached 1 million members. That was a lot of people. I know at one point, uh, First Baptist Church of Hammond, an independent Baptist church here in Indiana, uh, they, they were boasting of their hundreds of thousands of members. All right, So literally at one point, almost 200,000 members in their church there. It's a lot of people. And so I could be wrong about it. I know it was well over 100,000, but it might have been 120,000. But I'm not, I don't know. I mean, I, if you showed me 120,000 people and 200,000, I wouldn't know the difference, okay? It's a lot of people. Um, and I don't think that was like evangelistically speaking, right? We know what that means as far as a couple thousand people out there. So the, the, the concept here is that, um, that there's, there's been a lot. There's been big churches. And uh, what has happened with the world and those dominions around them? crumble, right? This is what's happening. And so, so this is happening quite frequently. Um, if that was the case, churches be, should be holding on and changing their areas much more rapidly and more successfully. And unfortunately, that's not happening. And so, anyways, in this, he does tell them that you need to occupy. You, you have this area. You need to get things in order. You need to do what you're supposed to. Uh, you got to work. you got to work. Now, understanding where he's at on this one, uh, verse number 14. I want you to notice here that something happens. Verse 14, but his citizens hated him. Now, who does it belong to? It belongs to noblemen. He's got servants that serve him. And within that area in which this nobleman is going to be in charge of, the citizens don't like him. In fact, it says they hate him. The hating of, of um, this nobleman is, uh, is not spoken of much. We'll see it one more time at the end of the parable. But in verse 14, but his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. So they don't want the nobleman. The nobleman's in charge. You have the, uh, the citizens, I'm sorry, the citizens, the, uh, the servants. The servants are going are gonna to serve. They're going to do something and they're going to serve and they're going to do what, what, the, what the nobleman said. But the citizens have said, absolutely not. We don't want it. Now, there's no question that what Jesus is, is illustrating through this, through this story is the fact that he is represented by this nobleman who has come. He's come one time already, hasn't he? And when he came, he didn't just come. He paid with a price for those that are here. Now, in that, um, I think there's a point where we can draw too much illustration from this, where we start digging all the little details about Occupy and uh, conquering the world type stuff. But, but the concept is very simple. He made a payment, and he made a payment for here. All right? Jesus Christ didn't go to some alien land far away. I, um, I, was, I had a pair of socks on right now. I would, not that I'm trying to bring a lot of attention to my socks, but um, I thought there was like rocket ships on it, and I was meeting with somebody earlier. I looked down, I have aliens on my, on my socks. And so anyways, it's not, it's not exactly that, all right? Um, so the, the, the point on that um, was that, that it's not, it wasn't, he got chose this. It wasn't that he went to go and, and, and try to save the, the fallen angels, those that had departed from him, those, those that had rebelled against Jesus. It said he, he came for us, for this world. And so that's where we would take a statement like John three sixteen for God so loved the world. So he came for this world, and yet the citizens, even though Jesus Christ paid the price for the sins of the whole world, they say no. They, they hate him. They hate him. And isn't it interesting, the hatred that is out there towards Jesus? You can talk about just about any religion in the whole world, and you're expected to be accepted except for Christianity. Jesus Christ's name cannot be mentioned in public places without causing some sort of, some sort of negativity, some, some type of way that people will be uh, pointedly against Jesus simply by the mention of his name. It's, it's, out, uh, it's really a, a amazing, appalling but at the same time, it's also to be expected because the Bible is making it very clear this is what's going to happen, that the world will hate you because they hated him. And so this is something that we know Jesus is hated. This is what he's relating. Now, knowing that he's hated, that's kind of an unusual story at the time that Jesus is telling because he seems kind of popular. He's got crowds of people around him. In fact, he's about to enter in. We're, we're a little less than a week away from, from um, as far as in the story of him entering into Jerusalem and being crucified after that time. And so knowing that, as they're getting ready for that, he's quite popular at the entry. I mean, there's thousands of people that are they're crying out Hosanna, and we'll see that next week in, 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 the, in the continuation of Luke. But, uh, but with all that popularity, it'll quickly go away. And no doubt when you hear this kind of parable that he's hated, or sure, no, why would you hate the king? 
Why would you hate the one that's going to buy all this, that's going to do these things? Not only do they not understand that, they also don't know the great price that this nobleman, this, this Jesus, is going to pay for them. They're expecting something great, but not realizing that what Christ is giving for them is his own life to pay, to pay for the sins of the whole world. And so, um, so we see this continuing on here. People reject him. He has his servants. Uh, we can relate the servants, of course, to the disciples, not to mention anybody, anybody who's saved, practically. In verse number, um, verse number 15, and it came to pass that when he was returned, so what's, what's he talking about? He came, he died. He paid the price, he was buried, rose again, he ascended. And so now he's going to talk about when this nobleman returns to the land. So he's made the payment, gives the guys a job to do. Uh, the job, by the way, for, for us, it, and as we would see it in this passage, would be related, I think, to uh, Matthew 28, uh, or any of the other, other four references of the, of the uh, Great Commission, go ye therefore. Of all, all four of the Gospels and the book of Acts record the Great Commission in one way or another. And so when it comes to that, they have a job to do, occupy till I come. That's what's happened. Payment's made, occupy. Now, uh, he will return. This is a big story. When it comes about the return, he is re reiterating to them something, that Jesus Christ is headed to Jerusalem to do something. He's going to die for them. That's, that's the price that's going to be paid. He has explained, to this over, explained this to them over and over again. But he's given them this hope and this understanding in this death and of course, this coming resurrection is that Jesus Christ would ascend, but he would return. In fact, he talks about that, that he goes to prepare a place for you. And when we talk about that he's going to prepare a place for you, it's not just that he will one day welcome you at the gates of heaven and welcome you in, but I will come and receive you unto myself. So he's got a place and he's going to receive you and bring you to that place. And so we talk about that as a rapture. This is what he's, he's describing. This is good news. We get to look forward to seeing Jesus. That song that we sang, I will behold him face to face. This is what we're talking about. But in that return, that's that time where we see Jesus, it's not, it's not the end all. Because when we see Jesus, one thing that's going to happen after that, it describes that he will actually return to earth. You see, because he died for the people of this earth. In fact, when we talk about heaven, one of the things that we think about is, okay, we're going to go up in heaven. We think of clouds and we think of, of you know, harps and, and, and floating and wings and, and halos. And most of that's not true. The robes are true. The Bible talks about the robes that they'll receive. And we see that when, when the rapture occurs, that there's those that are, are given their robes and their crowns already in heaven. And so when that takes place, we, we understand that this return, that Jesus Christ will enter back into this earth. And in this earth, what he's going to do is he's going to judge. One of the things that's going to happen, though, we understand there is judgment against the world because of the rejection of them. That will come later, come verse, um, later on in the passage. But he's also, he's also going to address those servants that are still here on this earth. Now, we'll see this in, this in this passage here. And I want you to notice in verse number 15 again, it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Now, I do want to correct something I said. I said that they were left on the earth. The idea here is that there's this the judgment on believers of all time. I, I don't want you to think it's only those that survived the, the, the tribulation time period. Um, but anyways, um, this is what, what he does. So the king arrives, and he's going he's gonna to judge his servants. He's going to figure out, how, how have you done? Now, you know there's, there's, there's something important here, that these are his servants. These servants belong to him. Now, what do these servants do to become his servants in this story? Nothing. There's nothing. They're not, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a process where they applied and they were rewarded based on merit. They are simply his servants. And when, when they are rewarded with an opportunity to serve him, they're rewarded with a talent, which is a fair sum of money. I mean, some people would say it's around $50,000, maybe uh, with the inflation from the past few years, maybe sixty, sixty-five thousand dollars $65,000. It's a good amount of money. But, uh, but anyways, with what's given, we know that with what's given um, to them, he's going to see what they did with that. And this is, this is the whole point of the story. And so, uh, so anyways, the point is, when, if you notice at the end of verse number 15 again, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Verse 16, then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant. In other words, good job. Because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. 
The second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art a, an austere man. Thou takest up, that thou layest not down, and reapest, that thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee. Thou wicked servant, thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then, he gives him an option, wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. In other words, you could have just put it in the bank and made some interest on this, and at least I'd have something to go with it. Verse 24, and he said, and he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, Lord, he hath ten pounds. You notice that's a parenthetical there. It's kind of like, it's not really a part of the story, but he wants you to know something that the thoughts and reactions of other people is like, wait, what? But the guy already has ten pounds. Why are we going to give it to him? Well, it makes sense on the business side of things, doesn't it? For I say unto you that unto every one which hath, which, I'm sorry, and unto every one which, I know I can say this, I, I promise. All right. Verse 26, for I say unto you that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. As for me, it's a tongue twister to say that. You should go home and practice that verse over and over. Verse 27, but those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. So he's given an illustration here. Uh, a parable speaking about the kingdom. This is not something that is happening for them there, but it is something for them to understand in the future. Now, the parable would have actually rang, rang true. Something that's very, very interesting is it, that this story is actually very similar to something that had been taking place there. And the other thing that's interesting is that um, the story that had been taking place was actually taking place there in Jericho during that time while they were in it. Uh, so during that time when people became king, they didn't become king or come to power because they made everybody happy. That's how politicians get power now, right? You make a bunch of promises and, uh, and you don't ever plan on keeping them, but you make the promises. And, and so while you do so, people will vote for you or people will love you and put you in power. Well, that's, that's the idea. Back then it wasn't that way. They would do so oftentimes by fear. And so at some point um, there during this time period, there, were, uh, there was uh, King, or there's Herod the Great, which is a king. Uh, Herod the Great was very, very powerful. He had multiple sons that when he died, the kingdom was supposed to be left to. Now, to understand how this works is there was Caesar, who was like the king, and then the rest of the country was kind of split up into little kingdoms or similarities to what it had been run like before, and those kingdoms were under Caesar. And so in order to become king, Caesar actually had to crown that individual king over that area. So Herod the Great was a king. And uh, you'll find this other people, that is, there are several kings that are referenced in the Bible, they're all under Caesar. Now, one of the things that happened, and this is an this is a extra biblical story, you know, I'm just relating this for the sake of, uh, of um, kind of some knowledge of what was going on, on during that time. If you don't know the story, you would understand this parable just fine. But uh, Archelaus was one that was supposed to take over after his dad as far as his region. While he was there, um, he went to become king, and he was vicious. He was fierce. People didn't like them. In fact, on one occasion when he was assumed authority but had not been crowned king yet, there was a point during the Passover where Archelaus had actually killed 3,000 Jews. Just killed them. All right. So, so for that reason, you would assume that the Jews didn't like him. And you're right. They didn't like him. So what they did was, uh, well, Archelaus was on his way to Rome to be crowned. He wasn't just him, but he was also followed by a number of, of Jewish groups. And so a number of political or, or geocentric areas that were sent had their own entourages of people that made a case to Caesar for why they don't want him. Well, so they rejected him. We would not have this man rule over, over us. But here's the thing. This guy's in charge. This is his kingdom. Now, in that, they go and say, we don't want this guy. Now, with that, uh, the Caesar has an idea, right? We're, we're not going to give him the kingship yet, but once he earns it, then we'll go ahead and give it to him. So give him a chance. And uh, from this, this is actually why Jericho was, has a number of aqueducts built, and they have actually a, another temple that's built in Jericho, and he's just making everybody happy, so later on they would king him, and he'd get this. And it was a short amount of time, but he finally gets it. So so the principle, and it's actually, this is, this is not... Uh, like the only story. So I'm not saying this is what Jesus is referencing, but this was a principle they would have understood of somebody having authority but not receiving quite the king, 
the kingship yet. So, um, so anyways, this illustrates a principle for us that we understand about the things that are already but not yet. For instance, Jesus Christ came, he established his authority. He was very much king. There's not a point where Jesus Christ that we made him king. In fact, a lot of people talk about making Jesus Christ Lord. You're not making him Lord. He is Lord. You identify who he is. That, that's, that's a difference. And, um, and anyways, with that, we understand that, that, um, that he established that. And the Bible describes that what he came to do, that kingdom in their hearts. But there was a literal physical kingdom that Jesus Christ was coming to establish. This is something that's going to be experienced. The Bible talks about what we would call the millennial reign of Christ. That is the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ here on this earth. It's a physical reign. The Bible describes it as going to be centered in Jerusalem. In fact, the whole restructuring of the whole world, um, you'll have basically the flattening, the elevation of the city that he will reign from his throne in Jerusalem, glorified by his saints and reigning over the whole world. This is what's going to happen for a literal 1,000 years. After that, the devil will be released again. There will be the deception amongst nations. People will rise up against Jesus. He'll wipe out the rest of all his enemies, and that's it. Peace and prosperity forever and ever with Jesus Christ ruling and reigning kingdom without end is what the Bible describes. Now, that's a lot of, a lot of years of, of stuff. If you have questions, feel free to ask. I don't know all the answers, but I'll, I'll be glad to give you what I do know. Now, um, with knowing what, what he tells us, though, uh, we understand that, um, that Jesus Christ did establish th that part by the payment that he made. And then he ascended, and he's coming back. But before he ascended, he told the, the believers of this world, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. And the, the fact that he's coming back ought to motivate us in what we're supposed to be doing for Jesus. This is a big deal that he's coming. It's not just that he's coming. Sometimes we emphasize the fact that we're going to see him and it's going to be wonderful, but there's also a graveness, a seriousness to this. For instance, there's passages of Scripture that describe those that are working within the ministry, for instance, the deacons, pastors, that they ought to be grave. Now, the word grave doesn't mean, like, death. It literally means the idea of serious. I mean, I think, well, pastor, you're a goofball. Maybe, maybe, but the point is when it comes to spiritual things, there's a seriousness to what we're doing. And if somebody can't be serious about serving God, they ought not be in the ministry. That's just the reality. And so when he talks about this, why? Because of the fact that it is a serious thing to serve God. It's very, very important. So the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back is not just good in the sense that he's going to take over and all this nonsense in this world's going to be gone, but the fact is we are going to stand before him. And what he's addressing is not just that it's going to be wonderful he's back, but the fact that we need to be prepared to see him. We need to be prepared to understand that we're going to give an account of what we've done, and he's going to address the idea, the very important idea, that we have a responsibility to occupy until he come. You'll find this reference, till he come, till he come, the end, all those things, over and over in the scriptures, consistently speaking about the fact you're supposed to do those things until he comes. Frequently, we see this in Thyatira, until the end, you're supposed to do these things, and you'll be rewarded for these things. But the point is that we're all given resources. A couple things. One is that Jesus Christ is coming back. That's what he's trying to teach them. Now, for them, it encouraged them on a different level. One is that it's going to look like they lost in a week from, from this, right? They, they're, Jesus telling them this, and in one week, it's going to look like we lost. Jesus Christ gets killed. He's going to be buried. The, the, the way in which he's killed is the worst way possible, and there's no hope, no hope. Well, he will rise again. He's going to come back. That gives the encouragement. But for us, it reminds us of the fact that this is actually going to happen, that he's going to come back. The other thing is this, that Christ has given to you something. For them, he gives the illustration of the nobleman, that the nobleman gave his servants a talent. Now, how, how much is that? Now, I think to myself, wait a second, so they were all, all ten of them, which is interesting, by the way. How many, how many are mentioned in this passage as far as what they did? There's three, but how many are there? Ten. You guys don't know why? Me too. I have no idea. I've really tried to figure it out. Um, if you have some answer, I, I've got some thoughts, possibilities. But, um, but anyways, th no question that there's these three. It, it seems that the ones that excel the most are mentioned. And of course, the one that, that does the least is also mentioned. Um, but in this, all the servants are given one talent. Now, a talent, don't think of a single coin. Don't think about an investment in regards to how much uh, is given. This is a, a good size sum of money. But it's not a ton. It's not a ton. And, and so there's something given, and I would suggest to you that all of us have been given a talent, a resource. In fact, it's interesting that a talent would be the sum of, a sum of money that's required basically in a year's salary. And so this is what, what would be needed. This would be a normal expectation. We have things that have been given a resource for you to live off of. 
How many hours does the most successful person in the world have in a day? Anybody? 24. How about the person that accomplishes absolutely nothing? 24 hours. We've all been given that amount of time, right? By saying, well, somebody got to live 100 years, and that's why they did so much for Jesus. Well, how about today? How many hours have you had today versus all the other people? The person that led people to Christ this week, how many hours did they have this week versus you? Oh, but I have all these resources or problems and I lack of these things. We have the same amount of time. And God has given you these things, and there is an equality to which we accomplish these things. Now, there's no question. Sometimes there's elements of, of, um, of influence because there's more people around. For instance, today, we live in Indianapolis. You might say, well, there's bigger cities. There's New York and, and uh, Los Angeles and Atlanta and Houston. You go through down, down the line. We're all the way down to number 11 in this country, not to mention the, the mega cities that are in the world like Shanghai and Tokyo and, and um, cities of millions of people. I lived in a city of 9 million people down in Peru for a while. And so you have lots of people. And I say, oh, those are big cities. They can do much. But the reality is we still have a lot of people. And I say, oh, okay, well, it's just because they have such large areas. We haven't gotten close to reaching everybody in this area. Not even close. Do you realize that, uh, that a metropolitan Indianapolis, or as far as the greater Indianapolis area, uh, talking about Indianapolis and Carmel and Avon and Brownsburg, this region, which we have people from basically all those areas that come to church here, 1.2 million people. That's a lot of people. Maybe we need more opportunity. We haven't even started to scratch the surface of what we do have available here. And so, but we've all been given a resource. We've all been given a resource. And with the things that we have, what are you doing for Jesus? If you've been given those resources, what are you doing? The third principle is this, that you will be judged, and I'm, I'm saying this correctly, you will be judged according to the effort you make with your resource. Now, the first guy takes his one talent, and he, when, when the nobleman comes, says, I have taken thy talent, which, by the way, that resource is not from you. Maybe you're thinking, well, I could take this talent because I'm really good at this, or I could take this, and I can do it. Just do what God has given, do with what you've been given as much as you can for God. This nobleman comes, and this guy, one servant, says, thy talent hath gained ten. Now, what that means is the talent belonged to the nobleman, and the resource that was given to accomplish what the nobleman wanted, the circumstance, all of that, is what gained more. As believers, here's what's going on. None of us, none of us are limited. Oh, we just don't have enough, or, or we're afraid of messing up. The whole concept here is this, that you have something to do, so do it. Do it as best you can, and God will bring forth their influ the, the, the increase. It's his talent, his resource. Let that resource do as much as possible. It's great, because I think of my resource, I think, oh, boy, people are better than me at everything. I remember when LeBron James became a professional basketball player. And I looked at that guy, and I'm like, that guy looks old enough to be my dad, and yet he's younger than me. The other thing I realized is he's younger than me. I will never be as good at, Le as, at anything as LeBron James is at basketball. I, like, at anything in my life. I, I don't care what I, what I put my emphasis on. There are certain people that are, so it crushed my idea. I didn't want to be a basketball player. Um, but the point is, like, the pursuit of you can be anything you want to be. No, no, you can't. That's not my job in this world to be professional at anything or the best at anything. But the, the point that I'm making here is that, that you may not be the best like somebody is at something else. I'm not saying LeBron James is the best basketball player ever, okay? I'm not going to make such a statement, especially not from a pulpit. But the, the point is that when it comes to um, what we are doing, we're not the best at anything, but we have a resource, and it belongs to God. It doesn't belong to us, and we're supposed to use it for God's glory. But you will be judged not on the quantity necessarily, but your effort that's made. Now, even in the talent, which if we receive a talent, if we receive a year's amount of, of money uh, right now, and say, all right, this, you're going to go do something with this, that, that's a lot of money seemingly, right? Somebody gave you tens of thousands of dollars. But Jesus talks about what the nobleman's thoughts on it. It's just little. You've been given little. You did much with little. You've been faithful with Little, that's the point. The whole point is not necessarily that uh, they did a lot, but you've been faithful with that little. And that's why I brought up a lot. This is what he explains to him there in verse number, verse number 17. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little. A talent. Good job. With a very little, you did a lot. And for that reason... Verse number 17 ends with, have thou authority over 10 cities. Now, a talent wasn't what we would compare millions of dollars. 
but he did a lot with this simply because he was very faithful with it. Knowing that he was very faithful, the good and gracious nobleman says, 10 cities. You get to run 10 cities. Here's the point. You've demonstrated a faithfulness that has now rewarded you with a position over 10 cities in the kingdom now that he's returned for. This is what the Bible addresses in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, for instance. The Bible describes the fact that we will give an account to God for the works that we, we've done in this body, whether it be good or whether it be bad, whether it be evil. And when he's going to test these things, they will be tested by fire, whether or not they were done for him. And so when there's rewards given for that, some will be gold and, and silver and jewels, precious stones. It's going to happen. But then there's going to be the other ones that the Bible describes, 1 Corinthians 3, that are wood, hay, stubble. It's burnt up, then we'll test it, and nothing. Sure, they were work, and maybe they were even good, but they weren't faithful. They were not faithful works, and because of that, they'll be offered nothing. This is the concept here. Those that, that were faithful will be rewarded because of their effort. Now, the next one is five. Now, you might think, well, wait a second. The, the second guy, instead of bringing out five, or instead of bringing out ten talents, he only brought five. So maybe he wasn't as faithful. Maybe not. But he was faithful, and still, the reward is five cities, according to, um, um, to verse number 19. You might be thinking, well, he missed out. He could have had ten cities if he had just been more faithful. But instead of focusing on what he didn't get, I want you to focus on the graciousness of the nobleman. The nobleman, you might be thinking, okay, that makes sense, 10 talents, 10 cities. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make, you see, 10 talents is not 10 cities. 10, 10 cities is huge. That's an enormous responsibility. That was very little that he did compared to these 10 cities. And so now that you've managed this, you manage managed tens of thousands of dollars, I'm going to give you a budget of millions and millions of dollars over these cities, if you can put it that way. So imagine somebody here, you ran a little toy shop around the corner, you guys made tens of thousands of dollars over the course of time, so aha, very good job, you should probably be the President of the United States. We say, well, wait a second, this guy doesn't have the background. This guy doesn't have the history, this guy's never accomplished that, he's never run type, that type of thing, but the nobleman realized this guy's faithful, he can do it. And likewise, Jesus watches what we do, and, and our faithfulness with what we've been given, he looks at that and says, I want to reward you. I want to reward you according to the faithfulness you've done. So what happens if you're not faithful? If you're not faithful, we need to realize something. Our works still matter. I, I, we, we talk about salvation. Let me encourage you to be very careful about trying to express to people the idea that your works do not matter. Works matter. Not to save you. Okay, this is very important. But sometimes I feel like we knee-jerk to this idea that since your works don't save you, that the works don't even matter at all. Like, I can just do whatever I want. No, your works matter. As a child of God, as one of his servants, in other words, you've been saved, you now belong to him. As somebody that belongs to him, you now are by default a servant. How are you doing with that? How are you doing with that? Well, you know, I, I'm not saved by works. That, that's correct. But you know what? Your reward will be according to your works. And so and he will judge you not based on the number of things you accomplished, but specifically your faithfulness. That is the judgment. And so this guy, if you'll notice what takes place with this guy, and we already read it before, but I want you to see again in verse number 20. And another came, this is the third one, saying, Lord, behold, here's thy pound. Let me ask you, did the guy lose the pound? No. I wonder, I wonder, did the seven other ones lose the pound? Maybe. It doesn't say. We don't hear anything about them. Maybe it means because of the fact that this guy at least still had the pound, maybe he's trying to reiterate something to us. We feel like, you know what, we're fine because we haven't lost anything. We're saved. I, I, wouldn't, I would emphasize this one. This, not that the guy's doing anything wrong per se. In fact, maybe he's got all his ducks in a row that he's not doing anything bad. But you know what? He's not doing anything good. He's not laboring faithfully. You might say, well, that guy's super wicked. Or that guy's got everything right. But the question is not whether or not they're right or wicked. The question is because of their status with God, are they doing something? That's the question. Are you being faithful to do something for the Lord? We need to get this past this idea that all we're going to try to do is just be good. And we have these moral exceptions, I'm sorry, moral high grounds in our lives that we don't do certain things and we're characterized by what we don't do and we're not characterized by what we actually do, a faithfulness to God. This is what should be taking place. And so what he says, he comes up with these good things. In fact, in verse number 21, for I feared thee. By the way, should Christ be feared? Absolutely. Listen, I don't want to mess up because I know that there's punishment for his children. My kids fear me. And I, I don't mean that they're like in the corner trembling. That, oh, daddy gets home and they're going to go hide underneath the beds. And oh, daddy's going to destroy me. They're not fearful in that way. But they know something. There's consequences when they do wrong. And I'm just a person. 
I tried to be consistent, but I'm not nearly as consistent as Jesus. Understanding this, they, this guy says, I fear you. And you're right, you should fear Jesus because he hates sin. And maybe for that, he's saying, I don't want to lose my talent. So he protects, doesn't do anything with it. And I wonder how many people try to live in such a way that they're not going to lose their talent. They're not going to lose, they're going to protect it. This would be, in my opinion, this is kind of like the Quaker idea where you're going to go set up a city, set up on a hill, which I think is hilarious that Plainfield has the Quakers as their, as their logo. Talk about a... a Anyway, so just kind of a weird area where they're like the Quakers, like the vicious non-combatant Quakers will be our mascot. Uh, we will, we, I don't know. Anyways, um, it just, it's not a very aggressive type of mascot. I want something vicious, you know, when you're going to be on a team. But anyways, I'm Plainfield people, I, I know we have Plainfield graduates here, and um, we love you guys, and we're grateful that you're very passive. Um, but anyways, that, that being said, the, um, when, when it comes to the the, the, the the element here, they're doing something of purity. You have the, the Puritans that would try to separate from everything and not be in the world. And, and you're right, we shouldn't be um, of the world, but we are here in the world, and there's an impact to be made here. It's not for you to go and hide. One of the things that we can do very easily is we can isolate. And we make no impact for Jesus because we're so isolated we cannot impact our neighbor. And we're so fearful of everything. We cannot impact any single person. And this is what these, this guy's doing. Again, I'm not trying to draw too much too much. Um, beyond what's there, but the whole point is this was an insulated thing that he's given. Can I remind you, as a servant, you've been given something. Your goal is not just to preserve that, but to do something with it. That's the issue. And so when he comes to this passage, he says, he feared thee, because thou art an austere man. An austere man. The idea is he's stern, that he is, he is firm, he doesn't budge when it comes to this kind of stuff. Okay, good. Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. Yes, that is correct. When we do certain things, we serve Jesus. Who gets the benefit and the, and the credit for it? God. Now, you might say, well, you didn't do it. No, no, you were empowered to do it by what I gave you. And that's, that, is, that is God. That belongs to God. And we want it for ourselves. This guy wants the glory for himself. He doesn't want to, be, he doesn't want to lose those things, and so he doesn't give it to him. And so because he refused to give his life, his faithfulness to the nobleman, he doesn't do anything. In fact, all he does is he has the same talent and nothing else. What on earth is that? Oh, I didn't know if we need to interrupt the sermon for a, for a weather announcement. Okay, so uh, as things start blowing away in the parking lot, I'll let you know. But um, anyways, the, that, that, my rhythm's gone. So... The, uh, the point is, in verse 23, Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the banks, is what the, the nobleman asks, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound and give it to him that hath ten pounds. You'll notice this guy, there's no judgment of like, go kill this guy. All right, he's dead, he doesn't belong to me. No, it belongs to him. But what he did is he lost any possibility. He could have been reigning. He could have been doing much. In fact, he had the same resources. Maybe you say, well, you know, he, did, he wasn't very good with investments. He wasn't good with the realities. He just didn't do anything. And because of that, he'll be rewarded with nothing. With nothing. The, the concept here is that we will stand before Jesus, and while we may be looking forward to not being in the mess that this world is, the reality of some of us don't have as much to look forward to because there's not going to be much reward. And I say, well, what's the big deal? I heard it related uh, as a, uh, an amusement park. Isn't it great if we all just go to heaven? Yeah, listen, you're not going to go to heaven and just be miserable for all eternity because you didn't do enough for Jesus. You, you're still with God, but there's going to be a level to which that's going to be different for some people than others. Uh, I take my children. We took our children to an amusement park a few months ago, and um, my kids are at different levels. And it's actually kind of like a reverse order in regards to what, what they like. Like the oldest is more afraid of the things that the youngest is. You know, so like the youngest like, I don't care, jump, don't worry about the budget being attached. You know, and the oldest is just like, I'm not even going to get up there. All right, so, so anyways, um, they're, they're fearful, but they hung out in a little area, which is like a little kid area. And they did things, and, and they did this drop thing where like you, you go up really, really, really high, like 15 feet, and poof, you drop down. And that was just the scariest thing for them. It was a lot of fun. Boy, they had just a blast. But then with the teenagers, we went out to this other area, and this, with the drop tower or whatever it's called, like 4,000 feet in the air. I'm not sure how tall it is. It's way up there. People are really little. Uh, one of our teenagers passed out on it. I mean, <laughs> like literally going down. And so uh, it was a different event for them. Now, let me ask you, were they both enjoying it? Sure. But some got more out of it than others, right? 
Uh, now, teenagers compared to the really little ones is different. Uh, for really like old people, that might even be a cursing to go <laughs> to a place like that, right? It's bad. So it's different for them. But the point is that when it comes to it, it's still the same place, but some people get more benefit out of it. And so in that, and, and it's not a perfect illustration, right? You're like, well, what about this? What about concessions? All right, remove those things. It's just a parable in my own weak estimation of it. And the idea here when it comes to heaven, yes, you'll be in heaven. To be in heaven is not to be in hell. Praise God. But when it comes to that, there will be nothing to offer Jesus. If you're being rewarded with your crowns and what the crowns re represent is not just like, hey, good job, you won something. Literally, we're talking about reigning. This is what's going to be applied. We see this in Revelation 20 that we'll be given opportunities and, and thrones and power and dominion. We'll have areas in which we're ruling and reigning that God, we're rewarded with. Those are those crowns. And so those crowns are cast then before Jesus. Why are they cast before Jesus? Because in proximity to him, that you've been rewarded by him, those now belong to him. I will rule for Jesus for eternity if I get such reward from him. I will get to do something for Jesus. You know what that also means? You're also going to be close to him all the time. I, I want you to think about something practically. The upper management is going to be closer to the CEO of a company than the people on the bottom level, aren't they? Yes, we abide in God's home. I understand that. But there is an element that we are working closer to Christ in regards to what we're doing for eternity. Heaven is not just a place where we're just going to go and hang out and sing songs and eat fruit all day. There's work to be done. There's more things. We're actually going to do stuff. We're going to live in heaven for eternity. Are you, are, are you going to be laboring in such a way that he's rewarded you with cities? The goal, of course, is not, aha, look at my name tag. Guess what I did for Jesus? God's glory. God's glory. Don't miss out. You will be judged according to the effort that you made for Jesus. And for that, it's a painful reminder of the fact that we need, we need to do more. I'm reminded frequently about the fact that there's more that I need to do for Christ. I look back every single year. I'll go back to, uh, to about December and January. I'll start looking at the year and think, boy, I wish I'd done more of this. I've done more of that. Um, a couple years ago, I renovated a house uh, and... It was, it was going well. Um, no, actually, it was about seven years ago. I was renovating the house. And um, anyways, the renovation went well. We did a great job. It was beautiful by the time it was done. And, um, but anyways, my, my daughter asked me one day, hey, can we play? Can we, you mind if we play? And this is, this is heartbreaking. She asked me if we can play. And I said, you know what? Let me just finish this today. I'm almost done. We're just going to try to put some extra long hours just to finish it up because I don't want to do this for the rest of the year. And so uh, she said, okay. And I said, I promise. Look, I'm almost done, and we will be playing a lot more as soon as I'm done. And uh, anyways, went to the bank the next day. And so we go to the bank, and we were friends with the teller. It's a small town. Um, in fact, when we closed an account, they didn't ask for ID or anything. Like, yeah, sure, here you go. They gave them cash. <laughs> I mean, it was just like that kind of small town. And so anyways, uh, we went and we saw Pam at the, not this Pam, but another, the, our teller's name was Pam. And, uh, and Lily tells her, said, my daddy's going to play with me more when we're done with this house. You know, that broke my heart. And, and, and she was, like, excited about this. I'm going to get to play more with daddy. And I'm just realizing I haven't been playing with my daughter. You know, and she will never be that age ever again. Never. Oh, I've missed that for that time. And, and so, you know what ended up happening? I extended my, my labors into that house because I realized that was not that important. It ended up taking a few more months instead of a few more weeks because I wanted to play with my daughter. Because that, that mattered to me. That mattered more. I wonder how many things have become so important to you that you've missed what's most important. And there's going to be a point where you're going to realize something. You've wasted it. You've wasted it. You, you will stand before Jesus. And the question is, Why? What, what, do you, what do you mean? Oh, I had so much going on. I had so much going on. I had to be with my friends here. I had to be entertained here. I, I needed to make more money for this. I needed to do all this. And with all those things that we're going to say to Jesus, yeah, that's why I, I didn't do things for you because I had to do things for me. So you would take up those things that you sowed not. You know, those, those would be my efforts for me, and you would take those from me. I'm gonna t Jesus would say, I would take that resource, and I would give it to somebody else. And you won't get to serve him in the way that he wanted you to. Here's another reminder. There was 10 listed. What it mentions is only two that were rewarded. You know, I tend to believe that means amongst believers, it's a small number of people that are given their all for Jesus. Now, I would hope from amongst Charity Baptist Church, that percentage would be higher. I would hope that. That we could say, yes, we're, we're going to be rewarded, not because we're charity. You know, we go to camp, we've got our shirts from our church, and everybody's excited about their charity baptism. Other kids are like, we want to be part of charity. Great, here's a shirt. That's all it takes. And so, I'm just kidding. No, but they, they're excited to be a part of that. But, but in all that, the, the reality is that it's not for us. It's for Jesus. It's for Jesus. So are you serving him? And um, 
let me finish off with this one last verse in verse number 27. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them. You remember this from verse number 14? They would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. The point is, with the reward, one thing that's going to happen is then there's also going to be punishment for those that were not a part of this, those, those that did not accept Christ. That's what he's relating there to them. And so he's revealing to them a different type of judgment. So there's actually two judgments listed. See that? One is, what did you do for me as far as effort? The other one is, did you accept me? One is a servant. The other one is not a servant. And because of that, they will get, they will get destroyed. The Bible describes that as, as hell, right? The lake of fire. There's an actual judgment there where death and hell give up their dead and they're cast into the lake of fire. This is where you're relating. A very deep parable, um, but this is the fullness of what he's talking about. Now, obviously, we can make some more applications, but the point is this. Do something for Jesus. And one of the biggest things that keeps in mind, it's interesting, keeps in mind, is that there's people that will be headed towards that destruction. One of the most practical ways you can work is to spare people from that. And we can do it. And you've got the resource for it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Father, for what you've given. Praying, God, that as a church we would strive together for the gospel, but also that individuals would have that about them, that they would desire to honor, they would desire to work with everything they've got for your gospel's sake, for your name's sake. That there were more people that would be spared from verse 27, people that would, would be slayed before him. I know you make very clear, Lord, that this destruction is something that will be in front of even the saints, that we will be able to look over and see them that have been destroyed. And God, what a, what a terrible thought, God, that there are people that we know that we have not warned. God, there are things that we've not done for you. There are things that we've, we've uh, just literally thrown away moments and I think years that, that we could have served you and we didn't. And God, I'm praying as a church that we would be more diligent about this. We'd be more prayerful. We would be more, more holy for your name's sake and specifically we'd be more doing because we want to serve you. God, we want your reward, not the, the applause of man. Who asks us in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for your attention tonight. There's